Straight from Silicon Valley, three generations of venture capitalists and one guest judge equals Meet the Dreamers! Imagine that, they wanted another season. Entrepreneurs pitch billion dollars lost every year. We were both wandering aimlessly. The judges ask the questions. So what's special about you guys? We're able to stay on your platform. But here is the twist. You, the viewers, get to invest for equity. This is your chance to own a piece of the next big idea. To invest in a company, go to meetthedrapers.com, find them in this week's Entrepreneurs, and you can invest. You can share in their future success. At the end of the season, the entrepreneurs with the most funds raised are brought back for the season finale, where Tim Draper invests in his favorite company. Become an entrepreneur because it's easy to get money, and that didn't happen in Wall Street. Let the games begin. Welcome to Meet the Drapers. I'm Jesse. This is my dad, Tim. Today we have a blockchain expert extraordinaire, Punya, who works with Draper Associates and just knows everything you ever wanted to know about blockchain. Punya's got so much star quality, like Madonna or Beyonce. Only one name. This is Punya. And we also have our amazing guest. First time ever on the show, Sanjay Nath from Bloom Ventures, which is India's VC. Early stage VC. Early yes. stage yes. VC. Well, thank you so much for coming. I'm so excited you're here. Thank you. So Pleasure fun. To be here. And Punya, we're seeing quite a few blockchain companies today, so I hope you're going to just tell us everything we need to know and break Absolutely. it down in layman's terms. So I think what a lot of people miss about the blockchain space is the context behind it, like why it even exists and where it was born from. And so it's important to trace the history just a little bit. So the blockchain space really came out of this cypherpunk movement that happened in the late 80s, early 90s. That's really about coders who valued protecting freedom and privacy and things like that. And it's kind of that same moral almost movement that is propelling blockchains today. If we look at the ones that have survived, the currencies that are survived and done well so far, the people who developed them, the people who are pushing it forward are people who really believe in the cause. And I think that kind of like context of blockchain being beyond just a business is something that's often missed, but really important to understand. Yeah, what I love about it is you can take Bitcoin, notice the tie, Bitcoin tie, anywhere you want and pull it down and you can buy things in any country of the world. And that really resonated with me when I was talking to Sebastian Serrano from Argentina. He said, three times my family has lost its fortune to political whims of government, three times in his life. It's only 30 years old. And so he said, I'm gonna take Bitcoin back to Argentina. And people said, well, isn't Bitcoin too volatile? And he said, he said, are you kidding? <laughs> the, the Argentinian peso just keeps going down. So anything is gonna be more stable than anything we've got there. But it's not all about currency. Let's say this was a work of art dress. Yeah, it's work of art dress. <laughs> Um, <laughs> let's you say guys missed a to... miss car ride over here. My dress ripped up the butt. And so now I have a new dress on. But I'm glad you think it's a work of art. So let's say it's a work of art dress. And you can identify it specifically and put it on the blockchain and know that that is the only one. Yeah, absolutely. Blockchain is often described as the greatest inter disintermediary. It kind of started with the printing press, which allowed people to communicate complex thoughts across long distances. Next evolution was like the internet. And now I think blockchain is kind of the one that makes it even mathematically secure and digitally permanent, which is quite interesting. Sanjay, do you have any Bitcoin? As a fund, we have not heavily invested in that space, but we have done UnoCoin, which is India's first Bitcoin company, along with Boost VC. You know, interesting point that Punia brought up, we don't hear enough about the passion of the founder of the people who actually started the framework. One analogy is if you think about the World Wide Web and go back to what uh, Tim Berners-Lee started. It started by he wanted to create an open internet and wanted that information to be available. It's very difficult selling the first one. You have to sell it to people who just believe or think you're, you know, think you're nuts, but certain sets of people who get the gleam in their eye where there's something where if everybody did it, it would be really cool, they'll do it anyway. You know, that passion and vision. So it's interesting. I think we hear a lot about the blockchain, the Bitcoin, but not enough about the founders or the creators. So I think that that historical perspective is quite interesting. And in India, I understand that they're wavering back and forth whether and how to regulate the coins. How does it look right now? Ties uh, between India and Silicon Valley are very strong. And I think there's a very keen view to just follow what's happening here. I think creating these bridges is interesting. So it'll be, you know, we're obviously bet on Uno coin and as 
they become larger, I think there'll be a lot of fast followers behind that. So I think exciting times. Well, should we call in our first company? Sure. Good idea. But first, let's take a look at what's happening behind the scenes. Hi, my name is Francis Wong. I'm the CEO and founder of Bucket Technologies. And my name is Francine Huang. I am the head of marketing. And we're brother and sister, and collectively, we're known as the Franks. Our parents are entrepreneurs, and they raised us in a business-minded household, and so we get it. The reason why I started this is to solve the problem of physical cash. We believe increasingly if money doesn't move at the speed of the internet, it ceases to be useful to society. So we're out to essentially turbo boost cash, uh, make it accessible to the world. In 2003, I was doing some research for the Federal Reserve and uh, I hadn't really thought about coins until that moment. After the research project was complete, it became really, really evident just how wasteful the entire life cycle of coins was. So I think it's great to have family by your side, especially ones that are smarter than yourself. So it really helps us get through those, those lows. Welcome to Meet the Drapers. Thank you. <laughs> Give us your pitch. So the vision of Bucket is to accelerate the world into a digital economy. And we believe that there's a degree of urgency behind this. If money doesn't move at the speed of the internet, it ceases to be useful. Right now, this is 2018. Cash is still, by and large, the most frequently used instrument. So using game theory, design thinking, and a whole bunch of field research, essentially we've created a platform that we believe solves this problem by eliminating coins out of retail transactions. We've built a business that can bring in 3.5% of all the monies that we digitize. We should be digitizing no less than $166 billion a year. So how this works is our technology is really two fronts. The first integrates at the retail level. Just say, bucket the change, and the cashier would hit bucket. Stores the remaining coin change that I would get back on a ledger. They go into their phone, scan the receipt, and that money goes into a digital piggy bank. Every time that piggy bank crosses $50 in the US, you can move it however you want. Direct deposit to your bank, donate to a charity, buy Bitcoin. For the end consumer, we put upwards of an additional $300 into people's pocket, which may not be huge to the people in this room, but definitely not insignificant to most people. How's it going so far? What are your revenues? So we are actually just about to launch. We are launching in Northwest Arkansas in a couple weeks. And then we launch in Singapore with the monetary authority there. Have you gotten any funding for this so far? Two and a half million dollars in private equity. And we are currently engaging in an ICO. We're tokenizing our net income, which is pegged to a percentage of how much we bucket. The tokens will be a result of your profit. What if I buy your coin and then you don't make any profit? <laughs> well, that's... I guess a problem. Now you pitched us another business, entirely another business a week or two ago. Sure, yeah. And tell us about that and how you're gonna be able to do both of those things at once. Yeah, so time is definitely not something that I have in abundance. Strangely enough, I moved out to Northwest Arkansas to commit to the launch of Bucket first. Became close friends with the deans of the University of Arkansas. So I had written a paper I uh, submitted to the university essentially saying all of the only secure ways to store your crypto make it impossible to use your crypto. Sort of by accident, the university got behind the project. We're utilizing a ground up design of a chipset that essentially distills down to the mobile phone and the mobile app. So now you can carry and store large amounts of crypto and be able to interface it the way that the masses need to be able to ingest it. Are you CEO of both? Yes, I'm founder and inventor of the, the Kaiju project. How can an investor bet on you if your time is elsewhere? France really sells the vision for both companies, but operationally we're much more mature on Bucket. So are you co-founders? No. She's the head of marketing. She's my little sister. This is our first time ever working together. Oh, great. Yeah. <laughs> so your question before of how can you focus on two different projects, I'm handling one of the projects. You're handling Bucket? I'm handling Bucket. We've raised two and a half million. We've built the technology. If we want to accomplish our vision, we need to be everywhere cash is. It almost feels like physical cash is being phased out already by like non-blockchain technologies. So yeah. it seems like the digital, wouldn't the digital cash conversion be equally as valuable? Yeah, I completely agree. I never have cash, yeah. ever. 
So in the US, 68% of all transactions are cash. That's US. When you go to Italy, Spain, Germany, they're 85% plus. Last month, the chairman of the Federal Reserve of the US pretty much said that there is no slowdown in cash. It's not dying and it's a problem. If this works, you're going to put not just Arkansas, but Northwest Arkansas on the map, right? Very interesting. <laughs> so our lead investor is from Arkansas, but it wasn't mandatory that we move there. What actually became very appealing in Arkansas is that it's a captured market. So even if I were to take mm. out an antiquated billboard ad, far more efficient because everyone that sees it is exactly who I want to see it. Everyone typically lives, works, and, and plays in that. So it's a good case study. <clears throat> Perfect. Yeah. I wanted to just go back. You talked about interesting choice from Arkansas then to Singapore, right? Two very different places. So what is in it for them? Like when you go and convince the monetary authority of Singapore? Yeah. The conversation is largely consistent everywhere we go because every nation generally handles coinage the same way. So for banks, the cost of cash is between 5 and 13% of total bank expenditures which is a pretty crazy ratio if you break down the asset to what it's worth. Wouldn't you say though that centralized fiat physical currencies are what make banks relevant as well as monetary authorities relevant? Sure. So in, wouldn't they see this as almost competition with their existing currency? No, so we're not trying to eliminate the coins. We sort of see it as this river. What Bucket represents is a dam in that river that keeps coins and eventually banknotes, because we could do the same thing with banknotes, uh -huh. digitized at the institutional level. One day, it'll allow a government to come in and be like, we're ready, now we can forklift the, the physical asset out. How about the consumer? I mean, some old guy or old lady comes in and is expecting change back, but instead gets this receipt with a QR code that they've never seen before. Well, Bucket is, is consumer activated, so no cashier will ever have to say, would you like to bucket the change? The consumer always activates the process. Well, that's going to slow down the whole spread of this. When Uber launched in San Francisco, they had a pretty steep learning curve. They had to teach all of us how to call a cab again from scratch, right? But by the time they got to Little Rock, none of that messaging was there. Everybody there knew what Uber was. They were simply waiting for them to turn Turn on. So for us, even though we're launching in an outlier captured market, you still have Taco Bell, McDonald's, Starbucks, Walmart there. With every retailer that we launch with, the idea is here are your applied savings, additional revenue, so we can pretty much find where we have the most density of those participating and then begin expanding outwards. What are your backgrounds? My last corporate America job was with Unitas Global. I was their chief scientist. Helped design private enterprise cloud infrastructure for everybody from Forever 21 to Molina Healthcare. And I've done marketing in the technology space. She's done it for some pretty big pretty agencies big, yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah. <laughs> Humble. Yeah. <laughs> Terrific. Well, thank, thank you so you much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Here thank you. The Drapers. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you. It was exciting. Thank yeah, you. Very. I'm glad I expected this, but the level of questions went really deep, so they were as intelligent as I suspected and had seen. <laughs> I think that Tim Draper really understands the big picture of things and is focused on that, and because of our mission-driven innovation and what we're really trying to solve, I think he will understand it. So you can check out token.buckettechnologies.com. We're currently in an ICO right now. We have a pretty cool revenue model and a way for people to make their return on investment. So we encourage you to go check it out. We know the grit that it takes to do a startup and we love it. <laughs>So what do we all think? I think it's a little odd for him to have pitched me two weeks ago on one business and now he's coming back with another. There's something about this maniacal focus on one thing, one product, one service. And if their loyalties are split somehow, I think it's a lot harder to do. We like to say sometimes that, you know, it's our job to be the VC. We don't want you to be the VC. We don't want you splitting your time between mm -hmm. two, three portfolio companies, right? It's a virtuous cycle because one of the companies that takes off, you tend to spend more time with them and the other becomes like a stepchild. And they obviously have a great dynamic between the brother and sister, but the fact is, if the other thing takes off, who's going to really run it? Because there's a lot of execution also. It's not just about selling the vision. What He's I like is he answer the questions right. really well. Yeah, I thought he was great, but as a female entrepreneur, I was kind of bummed out that she didn't really participate. Why'd you bring her if yeah. she wasn't going to participate and pitch with you? She's a marketing, a very skilled marketing person, but that's a very different skill. It's just, it's a silo. Yeah. It's not a CEO. So. I think the thing to note about these two projects is one, they're inspired by the same thing and are quite synergistic. Like the bucket that you get has to go to some wallet. 
if he also owns the wallet, which might be a natural progression of the company in the first place, it's a little logical in that sense. So you're saying that the two companies actually kind of work together. It's just he's almost like launching two products within the same umbrella. Why are they, yeah. why are they different entities? If they're synergies, is there possibly that they could be one entity? I do get the quandary, though. Until you have all of these little wallets out there, they aren't going to really make a dent in this yeah. bucket business. I think we need to vote. First, what we do is the we consult ball. the crystal ball. Yeah. So, so, so we all have put to consult the crystal ball. And when you get the signal, from the crystal ball. <laughs> buckets, buckets, buckets. Okay. So ready? We go thumbs, thumbs up, up, thumbs down, down thumbs, thumbs all, all around. around. Oh yeah, I'm just confused. That's what you said yes? Yeah. Hey, I'd be all for it but I have to be only halfway because he's only halfway. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm just confused which company we're running, so. Yeah. Anyway, it's not up to us. Do you want to invest in them? You could own a drop in the bucket. A drop in the bucket. <laughs> go to meetthedrapers.com and you decide. Now, why don't we go on to the next entrepreneur? But first, let's see what's going on behind the scenes. Hi, my name is Andreas Schem and I'm the CEO and founder of Rio and we are doing in-game advertising secured through blockchain technology. Nearly all of us are gamers ourselves and we love to play with our friends online, but some of them are from Eastern Europe where money is a bit more tight. So we thought, why don't we invent a way how we can monetize gaming without interrupting the user experience? What I'm excited about is that we could continue playing with all our friends all over the world without being interrupted in our gaming experience and we could be sure that botting dies down and no more money is being lost on digital advertising. It's super exciting uh, to be here with the Trapers because it's a great opportunity to reach uh, people all over the world and I also know that some of them are also very interested in blockchain which is awesome for us and basically just present our idea to a broader audience. Welcome to Meet the Drapers. So give us your pitch. So my name is Andreas Schem. I'm the CEO and founder of Rio. And what we do is embedded in-game advertising. We are gamers ourselves at Rio. So we don't like the interruptive ad formats or the pay to win or the high upfront prices. So we developed a solution to embed ads inside video games as part of the surroundings. More like product placements and film and TV and billboards in the real world. We provide that infrastructure for games. And we use blockchain technology because we want to solve another problem, which is ad fraud. There's a lot of ad fraud going on with over 12.5 billion dollars lost every year. That's How does the ad fraud work? Like bots and click farms or it's a phishing like website. Yeah, you fell for like one of these before. I'm sure I have. Yeah. I'm running an ad and here are the 500,000 times people have clicked on it, but the uh -huh. bot clicked 500,000 times. Mm -hmm. People didn't. How our blockchain solution works is basically we want to verify that a real person has seen an ad, so we write into the blockchain <laughs> the metadata of every single ad impression. What game developer, what advertiser, also how long has he seen the ad, how big was the ad on the screen. It's also dynamic billing. The better the ad impression, the more the advertiser has to pay and he only has to pay if a real person has seen it for at least some time. We don't even have a click-through because we don't want to interrupt the user experience. You're assuming the advertiser does not want click-through. We do, but that's why we do it twofold. We know you have seen an ad from where it was on your screen, how big was it on your screen, did you come nearer? And once you go into our marketplace and claim your rewards, which we give you in our tokens, then you get shown the ad again. So the best of two worlds combined without interrupting the user. So a bot could go in there and play the game over and over and over and go very quickly straight to all the big screens. We have user registration at our platform and also we do pattern tracking and if a user does the same route 20 times a day or even 20 days in a row, we can check that. So that basically minimizes the amount of money the botters could make. Who's the actual customer? So actually we have three. The advertisers cannot reach gamers right now. We introduced that not only for mobile, but for PC, console, VR, AR as well. The developer gets a new way to finance his games. That is not that pesky, I would say. And the user wins because he gets um, some tokens from us for participating and basically verifying that a real person has seen the ad. If you look at larger players like InMobi and AdMob that power the mobile ads, how do they fit in the ecosystem? They come between the game, basically. You play the game, then you watch the ad. Our solution is why 
while you play the game. Of course, we are competing for advertising budgets, but we can absolutely be used in addition. And our blockchain solution could even be adopted to other models as well. Are you hoping that some of these developers look at your technology and say, I know, I'm going to create a game that's completely around ads and tokens? He's selling an ad company, Dad. I get it. But you're I thinking think we're playing Mario bit. Brothers and like going to get yeah. all of the mushrooms. I have a demo, actually. Yeah, go ahead. How do it's a demo. I think That'd be great. So basically, just what you see here, this is the Unreal Engine, a game development engine. So here you can see a house in a forest. This is an ad space, and when the user comes in, he sees... And Chuck, you're from Republic. Oh. This is so exciting. What, what? we're doing <laughs> to break through. Oh, so it's... It's audio and video. Too. It could be both, yeah. I think maybe we should build a house that has a big billboard <laughs> at the top yeah. that says Meet the Drapers. Great idea. It. I think it's a great idea. I feel like advertising has really blossomed in value partially because you can get customized ads because you have access to a lot of data that these ad distributors are able to get. I don't think you can get that same symmetry in a game. While you might be preventing loss, it might not be as effective. We have gamer IDs. So if you're a gamer and we uh -huh. present to you five car ads and you look at them and we present to you five beverage ads and you see them and you look away. And we have found out you're probably not that interested in beverage ads because we don't look at them. And we have a matching algorithm to provide the best matches possible because this is dynamic. This isn't there forever. And the user gets a token for looking, right? Exactly. So are you launching a token or are you raising money for your business? We're both? launching a token. And we actually have a two-token model. The one token I've already described where all the metadata goes, and the other one is the one we are basically issuing. Why wouldn't it just be one token? As an advertiser, if you want to spend 50,000 on advertising, you want to get a value of 50,000. And as cryptocurrency is usually fluctuating, you don't want to get 30K or 150K, you want to get 50K. Our internal token is stable, doesn't fluctuate. And the other one, the access one, the more tokens you hold, the more access you get to our market intelligence, to reduction of transaction fees, to the possibility to add advertise within our ecosystem is the one that is on the marketplace and is being traded. And the more reductions they want, the more tokens they have to have. We already have some launch partners. Now we can reach up to 40 million of uh, gamers. And we have found advertisers that have signed with us which have over $150 million in uh, advertising budget every year. And as our tech is basically already there, we are very likely to issue our first use cases this year. I'm yes. surprised that nobody has tried to put billboards or some sort of logo within games. In fact, I would, I would they are. They, that they have. Oh, they are. Currently, I agree, there, there are solutions for that and some use cases were generated by other companies, but that's mainly static. So you put it in once and it's there for the whole game. And that's difficult to price. If a game gets sold like five million times, let's say, how many people actually see the ad over there? You don't know. The developer doesn't know and the advertiser doesn't know. So how does he price it? The developer says, well, potential reach of five million. The advertiser says, potential reach of 5,000. So. Yeah, with our dynamic solution, we only pay for what has actually happened. And that is a new approach. What's your background? A laser tech in Germany. I created a franchising chain and the community management. And also the German laser tech league is still up and running. So my background is basically PR, community building. We all, of course have coders, like we have a CTO, we have two Are you the founder? There. Yes. I'm Why do you care about this? Because I'm a gamer myself. A lot of my friends and my co-workers, we game together and we have a lot of friends, for example, in Asia and in Eastern Europe, and they cannot pay for all these AAA $80 titles. So we want to make it more accessible, but not through pay to win, where just the guy wins who throws in the most money or where you get interrupted and just wait for a few seconds. But on the flip side, the banner and ad itself might cheapen the gaming experience. So we don't want games that are there to advertise. We want ads that help with the game, basically. There are even studies that have shown in-game advertising that is embedded has its highest acceptance rate with over 90% plus. So there are studies to prove that what we are doing is the correct approach. Well, thank you so much. Thanks, Thanks for coming you. to meet the Drapers. Yeah, thank you so All much. Right. So nice to meet you. Yeah. I had a lot of fun and there are a few surprises. I think I should have talked a bit more about my team. But uh, there were so many questions and they, they were so engaged in uh, what we are doing that I basically got lost and forgot about it. It was really easy to talk to them because they were very involved and yeah, I was positively surprised how much they knew about in-game advertising. Like that is a very specific topic, but they were well prepared. I think Tim Draper would invest in us because he is very interested in cryptocurrencies and in blockchain. And that's what we are basically enabling through our solution to bring blockchain to gaming and to advertising, which hasn't been done before. People should invest in us because what we do is the future. Our solution enables us to basically get everybody on board. It's a triple win solution for developers, for advertisers and for gamers themselves. So what do we all think? 
I like him. I think he's, I like he's him into too. it. He kind of has a, <laughs> a good feel to him. He's a good vibe, a very positive guy. I've seen a couple of companies where they're doing in-game advertising and some that have done tokens. I think I'm separating the, you know, what he's trying to do in gaming from the tokens because it looks like they could be different monetization models. Well, first, I'm not convinced that this needs a token, at least not immediately to prove out that it works. Second, a lot of games have like a role-playing element to it. So if you see like a, an Xbox ad in like a medieval like night game, like it's kind of weird. What he's saying is, I won't interrupt your user experience and a good uh -huh. designer might be able to design in these ads and make it a lot easier. There have been a lot of successful models that have been able to monetize without advertisements at all. And then I feel like once games do blow up, like serious long-term games do blow up, they won't use this. I think he definitely has the background and he has the passion. Teams have been in ad advertising his whole life. I think as far as the team is concerned, we didn't get enough into the rest of the team and how he's going to execute it. If you move from the team to the market size, not sure how big the market size is and how differentiated it is. You know, you can be based in the Valley, but maybe the market is outside the US because he seems to understand the German market very well. He was talking about laser tech, which was like news to me, right? When he lit up, it was when he was talking about laser tech. His eyes lit up in something he did in the past instead of lighting up for something he's going to do in the future. Let's consult the crystal ball because I don't know. I feel like you're digging. Vrio. Okay. I, I need the crystal ball for this one. Are we feeling Vrio? Vrio. Rio, Rio. Okay, I got, okay. I got some. What do you guys yeah. think? Ready? Thumbs up, yeah. thumbs down, thumbs all around. Oh, that's yeah. interesting. I was the most optimistic. <laughs> the reason I'm very, I'm more optimistic, yeah. I think, is that this is a really big market. Oh, I gaming is. is. I, that's what I couldn't. Gaming is about. growing super big. His boat might rise with the tide. Okay. Well, we all didn't think so. We completely disagreed. <laughs> Which I'm perfectly comfortable with in my life. That's the way it's always been. And then eventually people come around to my way of thinking. That's usually the way it works. <laughs> you, the oh, viewer, yeah, you. can decide. Go to meetthedrapers.com and you can invest. Let's bring on our next <laughs> entrepreneur. But first, let's see what's going on backstage. Hi, I'm Matt Wilkerson. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Paragon One. My inspiration came from my experience in college. I felt lost, didn't know which career path to pick, got into my first job. Year in, from typing so much, I got tendonitis in my hands. I thought, what am I going to do here? A vice president came to me and said, look, the interns, they don't know how to do their jobs. Nobody has time to teach them anything. So I taught them how to do their jobs. By the end of that summer, all of them had full-time job offers, which is rare. That had a huge impact on me. I've never done anything like this on television. Being here, pitching to the Drapers, I'm feeling thrilled right now. Welcome to Meet the Drapers. So give us your pitch. I'm Matt. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Paragon One. We're simplifying the path from college to career. This is done through a network of professionals, advisors who help students and guide them along the right path. The idea here is that colleges and universities, as we know, can be quite expensive. But students are coming away not knowing how to land a job. We have Leo, an international student. He wants to break into consulting, but he has two problems. First, he doesn't know how to actually get interviews. And second, if he gets an interview, he doesn't know how to do well at the interview. So with Paragon One, he takes a short assessment. We then guide him through what we call a career learning plan. He goes down each checkpoint and he checks off goals towards eventually getting a job offer. We've already seen 240% year-over-year growth. 97% of our students are getting job and internship offers in the fields that they care about. We're actually seeing an opportunity for a $3 billion total addressable market in the United States. China and India were already looking at as target markets down the road. Now, the business model is tuition-based and subscription. I started this company because I've been passionate about career education all my life. So there's- See, it's not hard to create a platform for mentors to reach students. So what's special about you guys? So just getting a resume fixed, having an hour coaching session, that's, that's easy. But how do I take someone from resume to cover letter to LinkedIn profile? How do I do a mock interview? That's a very complex path. And so we've actually built custom workflow software that is tailored around the experience of advisor and student. And it's put in the seat with a coach. So the coach monitors the entire process from beginning to end. Could you use that software for other verticals? 
We actually see the opportunity now to go eventually to institutions, and we're already talking to companies that work with universities. So I think the reason why these type of models haven't been able to get massive traction is because they're not as individualized as clubs and career centers on campus, but the information they provide isn't as scalable or as generalizable as like a Google search or a Wall Street Oasis for finance. When you actually have this crowdsourced network of information and you have data behind that and you provide a really good match, that's where magic happens. Yeah, but then you encounter like a two-sided marketplace problem, whereas how do you get quality advisors who have phenomenal existing careers to join your platform and mentors too? Right, we actually manage that problem in two ways. There's actually a concept of what we call a coach. Their job is to make sure the student is staying on track. The industry advisors are people who work in different fields, they have an expertise, but they don't have to worry about, am I pushing the student forward, am I tracking them in the right way? The coach sounds almost like a virtual mom making sure you do your career Some, homework. Sometimes it is, it's that support network. <clears throat> I want to hear about the conversation you had with your co-founders when you decided to do this. Byron, my co-founder and CTO, we've known each other for 15 years. And together between us, we've started, run, and exited three internet companies. We both went to MIT, great school, but we were both wandering aimlessly. Years later, I kept talking to him about how the students I was coaching on the side, they were just like we were. Further in debt, probably, than you are. Much further in debt, yeah. right? 1.5 trillion. And they're doing the same things going to job boards, going to career fairs. You wouldn't tell a friend of yours who's working today, hey, go to this job board or go to a career fair. We know that's outdated. I realize that my success today has been completely through the network of people that I met along the way, 100%. It wasn't what I learned at MIT. I don't remember any of that stuff, quite frankly. Students have this opportunity to pick the first few steps of their life. And the professional world out there is essentially closed off to them. There's all this knowledge that people have and people actually want to help. So if we can unlock that knowledge, suddenly students are now picking a life that's meaningful for them. And they're not joining the workforce saying, okay, now what, now what, what do I do? So you really don't remember anything from MIT? Look, I mean, my 6002, 6003 EE classes, those are probably ones I want to forget, but I remember the relationships. I remember my mentors, the very few that I had when I realized I should start doing this very late. One would imagine that like valuable mentors come out of broader interpersonal interactions. It almost seems like paying for it would cheapen the experience and make it a little bit more commercial. We're gonna be soon launching what's known as income sharing arrangements. Until a student gets a job with a salary, they don't have to pay us anything. And they only have to pay a small percentage back over a fixed amount of time, and after that, it goes away. Quick, uh, quick question. You know, you talked about India and China. It's an interesting problem out there because you've got a huge drop between the top tier institutes, and then you have a lot of people graduating but don't have jobs. So there is a pain point. But what's the stickiness, and why do they come, and why will they stay on your platform? Because essentially, it's the same market, right? It's the job seeking. So what's the? Sure. We look at the advisors as just important as users on our platform, as students, because if they're not engaged, they're not going to stick around. The payment that we give them is there to help them understand that this is important, they take it seriously, but we do things like provide them with agendas and content so they don't have to do a lot of preparation up front. And most importantly, we make sure that the students, their feedback, especially the positive feedback, comes to them often and they feel gratitude for that. This is interesting because I've been focused on this a lot at Draper University, the same group of people. I know you've got an interesting problem. Thank you so much for coming to Draper's. <laughs> <laughs> so nice to meet you. Which Draper is most likely to support my company? I think Jessie could because, as I understand, she's a new mom, I'm a new dad, and I'm already thinking about what world will my children go into in the next 10 to 20 years? What will education look like? How will they enter the workforce? What careers will they be developing? This idea around career education is on my mind with regards to my children. On the other hand, I understand that it's very possible that Bill Draper could see a lot of the potential for what we're building. We attracted a lot of international students as our early adopters from China and from India. And so I'm already seeing a lot of potential to bring Paragon One into markets like China and India. It's funny, Punya, that you said, you know, it cheapens the experience if you have to pay for it. I don't believe you should have to pay for mentorship. There's a difference between tutoring and then providing mentorship, and I feel like we should just encourage a society that wants to help each other. <laughs> yeah, and I think the confusion that people have when picking their career path, it's not just a lack of knowledge, it's also how our education is structured in the first place. And I don't think such a solution really like hits the core, which is why they're never able to scale or grow or become prevalent.
Right. I think it is an interesting pain point. In India, for example, if you look, you looked at it, right? You've got, you know, the bits and the IITs that all of us went to, and then you've got a huge drop between the next universities. These guys, kids are coming out, and many of them don't have jobs. I see the problem. I see the market size. What I didn't see is how compelling, how different this was. I actually think it's okay to pay for mentorship. It's just a definition thing. If you called it a trainer or a tutor, you would expect to pay. Yeah. yeah. I actually think that this is going to be a big breakthrough for a short time, but then the education system is going to catch up. I mean, at Draper University, we are trying to lead the way toward a new way of looking at education. Create your own jobs. A bunch of other schools are trying to get education to job to be a closer match. And so I think that this might just be a temporary phenomenon. Putting my 15-year hat on, I'm not so sure this is going to be a big winner. So should we vote? Well, let's let's listen to the <laughs> listen to the listen. crystal ball first. Paragon one. What, what do we it think? It sounds like an Paragon. airline. It is. Yeah. For a, or, for uh, a financial or organization. Yeah, exactly. yeah. Yeah. I've got mine. Okay. Thumbs up. Thumbs down. Thumbs all around. But he was really great. Whenever people say. I am really passionate about this. It makes me feel like they've heard from me saying, we like to back people who are passionate about what they do. Yeah. But then the second out? time I asked out? the question, the real passion did come out. I do think he was passionate about I it. I think he got into it. I, I think, think he's he was passionate into about it. it. But That's his life path and yeah. good. Was this the company for you? Do you want to back mentorship? Go to meetthedrapers.com and you can invest. You should stay tuned to listen to my dad's crypto chat up next. So I'm here with Monica Puchner and she's starting a company called Hilo and somehow she wanted to come to me for some advice. Monica, welcome to Meet the Drapers. Thank you so much. And tell us about Hilo. So we are creating a social network for crypto. You can follow your friends, follow other traders, and then you can see a dashboard of what people are saying on why the price is falling. Maybe there's regulation happening and that's impacting the price in some way. Are you launching a token that's gonna be used on this platform or are you gonna go with Bitcoin? We did write a white paper. We are gonna be launching a token. That will probably happen at the later part of this year. Good. Coming so yeah. here are the things I would think yes. about. One is, where are you going to be domiciling your token? Yeah. And I would pick, I think most people are going to Gibraltar or Malta or Singapore mm -hmm. and just make it simple. The lawyers have been making hay out of this and they're doing a beautiful job of <laughs> creating a really complex yeah. system for you. Make it simple. You know, you've been involved in Bitcoin for a long time. What kind of advice would you give kind of young entrepreneurs? If the company wins, you want your investor to win. Of course. If the token wins, you want your investor to win. As an investor, what yes. I look for is aligning myself with the entrepreneur. The alignment requires me to own a piece of the company and a piece of the token. Mm -hmm. When I look at the business, mm -hmm. I'm usually looking not at the ICO that's being sold to me. Is there a reason for people to buy those tokens after the ICO? Is there a real marketplace that is being created? You're saying, hey, we're gonna be the community around yes. tokens and yes. Bitcoin, and people will talk about it, and then they're gonna wanna trade in some sort of token. Make sure there is a reason for people to buy those tokens. Yeah. What's happening now is all those tokens everybody bought, now they're all going, wait, what do I have here? Yeah. And then they're selling them into Ethereum, and Ethereum's falling because they're yes. trying to get out of Ethereum. Yes. The ICO aside and the, and the token economics aside, what should I do next as an entrepreneur? What would you do? I would think long and hard about the token mm -hmm. and how it works. Just go back to the, just the basics and say, why are people going to buy this token? Why are they? How are they going to use the token? And just really understand how each of those pieces work. And you've got to create a network that Facebook can't just turn around and create. Right. Because they have 50 billion users or whatever it is. <laughs> Almost the entire world, right. right? And then why are you and your team particularly suited to do this job? Yeah. And why is it somebody else isn't? 
if somebody was asked you, okay, how do I learn more about Bitcoin today or crypto? What would you tell them? Where where yeah, would be the first probably, place? Well, to- at first I'd tell them to go <laughs> buy some. Yeah, that buy would be some. At Coinbase. Exactly. Or crypto, I would go say, go buy a ledger. Yeah. Get it out and then look at it and say, I don't need a bank. Yeah. I got money right here it's on mine. this little thing. Yeah. This is mine. Yeah. I tell people to do those two things so that they know it themselves. It's not all hearsay because yes. whenever I look at press, I train myself to say, who wrote this? Yeah. Every yeah. time, every time I read something, who wrote this? <laughs> Why? Yeah. Why'd they write it? Instead of like, oh, these are all the facts that must be true. My advice to you is make sure Keep there's it simple. a simple and make sure there's a <laughs> real reason for me to come to your site or ideally for somebody who's a lot younger than me to come to your site. Yes and your customers will grow with you, be flexible and grow with you. So keep that in mind. Thank you so much for the advice, Tim. This has been wonderful and glorious to get to meet you. Your advice is gonna really help us traverse the next steps in our journey, so Monica, it's great to have you here. Yeah. And since you've been on Meet the Drapers, what happens is we adopt you. So now you are a Monica Draper. Monica Pukner Draper. Okay, Monica Pukner Draper. Okay, awesome. So welcome, thanks for being on the show. That was fantastic. Wow, guys, yeah. great companies today. What did you think? Yeah, Absolutely. I think it was really an yeah. interesting combination of companies and very different uses for tokens. Some really valid and some kind of thinking, how do we add a token here so we can raise some money? Yeah. Punya, I'm curious what you think token-wise. Which company do you think had the most viable idea to launch a token? It's an easy choice. It was the bucket. The bucket, bucket, yeah. right. It would have been so easy to force that like, you know, the change you get back is in the bucket token, but they didn't do that because they understand why a token exists in the first place. And it's not just something you push everywhere as a marketing scheme. Sanjay, what do you think? You know, I, I think the quality was very interesting of the founders that came in. They're all trying to solve very different large problems. Interestingly, I think the first entrepreneur that we saw is the one that we tend to like the most. <laughs> that's the most, and that's what life is. Let's say we each have a thousand dollars. How much would you put into each of these three companies? I would put a thousand into the first one. <laughs> okay. I think I'd put about 900 into the first one and then I'd put 100 into the gaming, the second one, just because I don't know the market. I don't know how big the market can get, but it could be an interesting space. So in the gaming, I'd put about 100. Uh, in the last one, I'd put 200. And the rest, 700, I'd put in the first guy, but ideally have him collapse or combine the structures. So you're basically investing in a hold, holding company and you have a piece of both. We've just seen that you want to do these structures right up front mm-hmm. and not do it later when you have different values and different investors and then people fighting, right? I think so I'd nice. sit on my thousand dollars. He just wants to be <laughs> Oh my goodness. It was a little bit of a setup, but you know, that's what we do here. Oh my on gosh. The is it, yeah. Anyway, well, it's great up to you. Day. It's up to you. Our viewers are able to invest in these companies and it's only on Meet the Drapers. No other show in the history of the world has ever had crowdfunding as an opportunity. Go to meetthedrapers.com and you, you can invest. Okay, ready? Look at that camera right there. See you next time on Meet Meet the the Drapers. Drapers! There is one thing we haven't done. Sanjay, you are a new member of the Draper clan. Welcome. You are now, you've been adopted. <laughs> Welcome you. to the family. Welcome to the family, Sanjay, Sanjay. Draper. And, and actually, Ponia. <laughs> Thank Welcome you. to Thank the family. Welcome. Ponia Draper. Absolutely. We I have some new siblings. New, new, two new adopted members of the family. So, so now will you show us your best entrepreneur dance moves? Okay, we're going to do that. Oh, interesting. You dress for that. You can do it. <laughs> no, no, we've all got to do it. Okay. I want to see that. Okay, one, two, three. Like the token. Here comes the music. <laughs> Live long in blockchain.